Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As we've got a quorum present, I'll uh, declare this meeting of the committee open. I advise that the meeting will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and the recording will be published to the internet. Please note that this means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. The Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and we pay respect to their elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present. I have apologies from uh, Councillor Kira. We've received no others. Um, we we'll move to confirmation of the minutes. I'll seek a mover in a second uh, to move there a track record. Thank you, Councillor Knowles, South Councillor Ho. Any comments, members? We'll put down that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Um, this brings us to discussion forum items. Uh, and we'll go straight to the presentation of uh, data, city data and insights. Um, did you want to make some comments, CEO? Yeah, three to chair, just very quickly. You would notice now there's a pattern emerging of us providing this information to you on a quarterly basis. As we progress, it will become more and more relevant to you, I think, and it will be over from quarter to quarter. So I just encourage you to, to start to become aware of this information. We're going to get maybe just to run us through the, the key highlights and, and extract some some meaning from them for you. But what we're hoping to do is use more and more data in our reporting and our and our rationalising what we're trying to do. So that's the intent. So over to you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as Matt said, you know, this is one of the series. So back in May we started looking at socioeconomic impacts. Um, COVID in particular. So we'll continue that page now with a bit more look to the future. Um, I will start with something about the economy. So you've already seen this in advance. So the, the data shown here is about our local economy and it's the forecast for the June quarter just ended. And what it shows us is this fall in our gross regional product and a fall in local jobs. But what I want to point out on this one in particular is that the impact on our residents is high. So the employed resident impact is higher um, is the highest of those figures. And in the past, we've also talked about the demography of our city, and that's what this is largely related to. So we have more younger people in this city that tend to be employed in the industries hardest hit by COVID. And also, it's completely normal for youth unemployment to be higher than unemployment in general. If we were to consider the impact of job keep on this, then those numbers change again, and the employed resident impact has been forecasted at something around 16%. So I think that's you know, maybe the, the key message to take out of this is that the, we call for supports for business and businesses and residents for quite some time to come. Um, in May, we also had a first look at um, the footfall data, but we looked at the city as well. So tonight we've just picked out a few areas within the city. Footfall was interesting because it's an indicator of the extent to which people are returning to the city and it's a good reflection of what's been happening at points in time in various areas. So the first one is the Rumble Mall precinct. So it started to stage a bit of a recovery in May, probably as stores reopened, more, more stores reopened, continued that recovery through June, possibly that's more people returning to their city-based workplaces. And, in, and towards the end of this period, which takes us to about the middle of July, you can see that footfall in the Rumble Mall precinct was actually exceeding 2019 levels. Now, bear in mind that it is the Rumble Mall precinct, so footfall is not a substitute for the number of shoppers. Um, transport terminates in the area. It's a three-way for a lot of other um, places within the city. But that's the same for any street, main street, really. Now, having a look at um, O'Connell Street, Interesting thing about O'Connor Street is it started 2020 with footfalls lower than last year. But it's had a nice recovery since about May. What's that? Maybe that's more people working at home, using their main street more often than going elsewhere. Had big resurgence in June, that blue line is quite exceeding, the yellow one from 2019. Could be a number of things. Events started to come back at the Adelaide early in that time, cinema reopened at the end of the month. There's a number of possible drivers for why that's, that's occurred. And now it's set back into something more like last year's levels. And then finally, the East End, which is 
So sort of staged the most consistent recovery after that enormous peak in March. It was, of course, festival in French time, and I think we had extra road closures in that precinct this year. So that's likely drove more um, foot traffic in the area at that time. But it's had a more consistent recovery, and it's now sort of steady, the last couple of months, steady above 2019 levels. So I look at that and I think, was the East End doing right? And what, what do we learn about that for other precincts in the city? So back in May, we also had our first look at retail um, turnover data. This one is um, the last, over the last 12 months to May of this year. Um, and we've included that just to highlight those peaks and troughs in the last few months, the ups and downs in retail spending. But I guess the main purpose here is what does the future hold for retail? So there's a question about what will happen when the government supports that are propping up spending cease. We know that spending habits are changing with more people doing more of their purchasing online. We expect that to continue. And we know that sanitisation and distancing are the top of mind factors in deciding where to stop in shop, in where to shop in store. So perhaps the key thing to take out of that is that we need to make sure that businesses are equipped to provide the environment that customers consider to be safe. And that means that retailers are going to, if they haven't already done so, they're going to need to continue to offer online and contactless payment options. They're going to have to remain vigilant about their approach to hygiene and distancing and maybe rethink their store layouts. I think that for us as the City of Adelaide, it's about making sure that our public realm also conveys that general sense of COVID safeness, because after all, you don't magically transfer from your home to a shop, go through other areas as well. So what do we know about how businesses are responding? There's this national level data and it's, it's all referenced on the slide. So what we know is that many businesses have changed how they deliver their products and services, including by moving more to online. But we also know that small businesses, which is the backbone of our local economy, are the ones that are least likely to have made changes. So this may indicate that small businesses need further assistance. Is it costs or is it capability? And they need that assistance so they can better engage with this changing environment. Last time um, the uh, topic of property market um, was raised at the end of the presentation, so we've put some information about that in, especially for tonight. Um, so it seems that um, businesses will be assessing their longer term need for office space and that we should be expecting a focus on healthy buildings and keeping buildings clean and the cleanliness of the transportation networks and the public realm where people have to transit through to get to their places of work. Um, there's commentators suggesting that CBDs, CBDs don't have the pool that they used to have. They're not as an attractive option um, for people to be. Um, and so this is the question, could we see a greater decentralisation of activity centres? And in that case, what do we do to make our activity centres the most compelling of them all? The thing about construction is it is a growth dependent sector, which is why I put that rather scary figure about the prospects for migration at the top of the slide, um, because that will markedly impact um, the construction sector across Australia. So Australia-wide dwelling approvals are at an eight-year low, although I have to say they're not nearly as low in South Australia as they are in some other places. And in common with the, um, the last presentation will end with something about people. And um, so this is about what their expectations are and, and their sort of prospects for when things return to normal. Um, and I think what we see here, what the data is showing us, is that there's still considerable reservation about re-engaging fully in community life. And so maybe that gets us thinking about what is the role of the city post-recovery? How will urban spaces be used? How can we promote safe and clean to local users, then to national visitors, and finally to international visitors again? It seems that there's quite a lot of room to inspire confidence and to lead by example in our approach to sanitisation, messaging, and taking the practical steps that people appreciate and that we can actually control. That's all I have for you tonight. Keep it short. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Rob, thank you.
thanks um, very much for that presentation. The data was really interesting. Um, I guess one of the things that leaps out at me is the concern around crowded outdoor public space. Um, and you know that is obviously a significant concern that people have. And um, I know a lot of cities around the world have been looking at things like you know, pop-up uh, bikeways, returning um, streets to pedestrians or opening and widening the streets so that there's more pedestrian access, widening footpaths, things like that. Is that something that's been um, investigated here and uh, is um, there the potential for us to do that here in Adelaide as a way of addressing some of those concerns? I don't think I'm best positioned. Yeah. <laughs> um, <Mark. laughs> Um, through the chair, uh, I know through the Recover and Reimagine Group, for example, we're certainly looking at creative ways of uh, particularly licensed licensed establishments using more public space, um, which again, working with the commissioner here is, is something we've had some success with. There is that real fine line, that fine line between trying to open things up and and, and address the concerns that are, that are here today. And in fact, the, the Premier was talking about that very issue. So absolutely we're looking at options, um, how we can use Sees an expanded footprint without necessarily being charged for that, so that they can they can meet the social distancing requirements. So, um, absolutely, those things are being acted in. And in some instances, we've done some things to assist in that in that regard. Just um, further on from that, I guess I'm I'm talking not just around um, the licensed venue space, which I think is really important, but in general, pedestrianisation in terms of footpaths and you know widening those opening that up, are they things that we could uh, look at as part of our response to address that um, concern? I think the, the lens that we look through is what, what's short term, what's medium term, what's long term. So uh, for example, the vaccination, you know, if there is vaccine available in the next 6, 12, 18 months, it, how does that link to you know, major infrastructure works that are about widening footpaths? So I think, again, I think it's Clinton and his team are certainly looking at options around those things, but it's a matter of the timing about, of our ways of capital to do that type of infrastructure vis a vis um, you know, a vaccine being made available. That'll probably be the, the, the game changer in terms of um, people using public spaces more than they currently are. Greg. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just back on the retail and spending uh, uh, chart. <laughs> Is it likely, do you think, that the, the, the spike, the buying spree in March, uh, as, as it's been described, was that the panic buying pre-shutdown so, pretty much? Yeah, thanks. Hello. Thanks, Chair. Um, just quickly, uh, the slide that refers to the east end, I assume that's um, Rundle Street and all the side streets at the east end precinct we're talking about. That's correct. Uh, okay, and second question. Um, you spoke about migration. Do we know, given the recent uh, media coverage around international students, do we know what the current statistics of international students that we do have here are and what was it pre-COVID and do we know where that's heading? It's there are figures coming out from the ABS every month on that, um, and it's well down, so don't quote me on this. <laughs> May and June is something like the international student visa arrivals that are virtually new for those two months, whereas normally I think May is something like we were seeing maybe 1,600 arrivals. In June, we may have seen about 1,700. You know, you know, if you think about what happened in 2019. So I can through the chair yes. a little bit. From my understanding through Study Adelaide, I think it's, it's over 35,000 international students in the city of Adelaide. I think that the challenge there is um, for some of those students being able to get back to their home country. So we actually had quite a few students still here during COVID. Um, I think the challenge from Study Adelaide's perspective in particular is the pipeline. So it's the next intake and the subsequent intake about them coming in. Um, which is highly reliant on, on things like international aviation access. And I think you, you may have seen the media um, post trial for 300 students to come in, which again has been um, reasonably contentious in the public space. Um, and then again, it is that balance between 
things that drive our economy. Every student creates four jobs, so they're job makers, not job takers. Um, but at the same time, there's clearly some, some concerns around um, where some people are coming from. Thank you. Members, any questions? Thank you, Chair. It, I think it's more just an observation which we know that, um, particularly if we look at uh, people's concerns, um, that we know that the attractors into the city are big festivals, events, sporting, um, and if, if one of their major concerns is crowded outdoor public spaces, that means that everybody has to rethink how they do things. The other one that is really interested is public transport, which then goes to, you know, what other transports are they going to get to, to use to come into work or to visit or to shop? And um, so uh, it, again, look at how we uh, look at integrated transport across the um, across the spectrum, um, yes, cycling, but also uh, we know in terms of the car parks and when we put the park plus for a lot of businesses, um, including our front line, so uh, dealing with police and, and nurses and things, they were actually using that to come into work because they didn't want to use the public transport. So um, um, I do like the optimism of return to normal routines within two to six months. That was probably the nicest thing I read in this. Um, and uh, so it would be really interesting to see. The other thing that the footfall showed was that across the sectors, uh, they had been reporting at the beginning of the year that these were some of their best trading years in decades. So whether it was tourism or hospitality um, or retail, that they'd actually had um, the first three months of the year were sort of pretty off the scale in terms of the retail or the spend. Um, which is why the dives have hit them so hard. So it's good to see the, um, the footfall coming back. Um, uh, being in the East End on uh, last Friday when we did the winter warmers, it's clear to see why they're getting that much footfall and, um, and it wasn't people just passing. So um, most of the hospitality businesses were full. What I'd be keen to do is understand what that means for various sectors, whether um, what that means for the retail sector as opposed to hospitality sector, as opposed to service sector, um, to see where that footfall is actually going and how those sectors are responding. So if we can get a little bit more, I don't know if we can actually drill down into that data, but... I don't know anything we'll there, but we can have it. would be great to see. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, through the Chair, from Council Members, if you have any further areas of interest that we're not covering, we're keen to hear about that to make it more relevant for you as we go forward. Thanks. Thank you. France? Um, I mean, uh, certainly the, the footfall that, that is, that is a, a measure, but I think, uh, um, you know, it can be deceiving. So the question here is particularly like when the rental wall for the conversation we had yesterday was that uh, certainly the numbers are there, but they're not spending anything. Um, so, the, so the actual, you know, the, the, for the traders and all the rest of it, they're not getting that, uh, that translation. So it is important to put that, these things into context. So if you say, well, here's the number of people here, but here's, here's how the actual spend works. Um, that at least gives you the, the economic value of, of that activity. It's just bringing people to a place. You can do that by uh, you know putting a fire alarm on and the building empties out and you've got you know 300 people standing in front. Um, you know it's more about how do we translate that and how can we encourage people to use the city. I think that sort of data would be very useful, particularly around those main areas. Mary. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I noticed that you've got the footfall for, you know, the East End and obviously Coral Street. Do you also do this data for Hart Street and Melbourne Street or is this is only concentrated on those streets? My understanding is that the census that collect this data are throughout the city. Right. And that we, we should be able to look at Hart Street and other streets that are of interest to you. Yeah. I'll Thing, uh, Melbourne Street as well. And I wouldn't mind um, finding out, talking about wanting further information. Um, I mean, I can see there's consistency with the East End and we can understand what's happening in uh, Rumble Mall. Um, but I want to know more about the main streets, uh, what is happening there and getting more information why that uh, didn't actually reach its, you know, peak and consistent to what last year and what happened. Uh, get more detailed information for that and for Melbourne Street. And I don't want to exclude that straight, but um, I would have more details in regards to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's... Okay. 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 
floor two, citywide business model, I think. And going to of course our star this evening is Michelle to large presentations. So you're welcome. Um, thank you, Chair, and just to the members, just by way of a very brief preamble. Um, thank you for being aware of the, the background of this important project. Uh, last, the previous strategic plan asked us to investigate models for a citywide business model, and the current strategic plan um, requests us to implement one. We had a recent council meeting where there was a decision to support a section 42 um, under the LDA subsidiary, so a fully owned subsidiary of council. And we were also requested to go and do some further consultations with various business and interest groups, precinct groups and the like um, around form, function, right? Um, of a new subsidiary, which is precisely what we've done in a, in a very thorough way. So uh, we've been working on this project for over 18 months uh, in, a, in, a, in a dedicated way. We're getting towards the, the pointier end now of, of discussions and today or tonight's workshop is very much to have a, a shared conversation with you around the findings so far on those further consultations and to get some further feedback from you um, individually and collectively around um, what you would like to see in or out of a citywide business model. So I'll just hand over to Michelle to, to go through some of the key points. Thank you. Um, through the Chair, uh, as you recall, we actually um, came to Council in uh, June and um, presented a number of options and we landed on, as Ian said, a subsidiary um, of council and at that meeting um, you asked us to go and hold a series of roundtables uh, to consult um, across the sector on what they thought a charter might include. So obviously a charter under the um, legislation really sets out the purpose um, of a subsidiary and what it does and how it does it, provides that enabling um, uh, uh, authority. So we went out and we held five um, virtual roundtables. We had six in there, but we had some low numbers in one, so we combined those and everyone who wanted to participate was able to. We had uh, 52 people actually participate in those sessions right across um, a range of businesses from the property sector uh, through to key um, tourism um, attractions uh, through to some of our businesses in our precincts and businesses who aren't in our precincts um, and a number of industry associations, the Rundawar um, Management Authority. So we had a really great um, participation rate and we had some really fantastic conversations during that process. Uh, in addition to that, we had um, a number of people looking at the online um, information and from the sort of 60 people we looked at it originally, we had nine um, surveys as well. So the information that you've got in front of you combines all of that feedback that we've received. Um, I sat in on every single one of the um, roundtables to get a really good sense uh, across what people were saying as well. Um, and then Ian, um, and myself have met with the Rundle Wall Management Authority as well, so in with the chair and, and with the general manager as well. So we also had them participate in around a couple of people, two, two board members participate in the round tables as well. So I think we had a really good outcome, people really interested. Um, I'm not going to go through, unless you've got questions, what the feedback was because it summarised a number of um, slides. What I do want to do though um, is really get your feedback on some of those key aspects in terms of the purpose, powers, functions, duties, uh, the board itself and, and funding as well. So something we haven't spoken to you about previously is funding. So the, they're the key questions that have come up. Um, so we put to them a purpose which we had presented in the paper to council, which was to accelerate economic growth of the city through attracting investment and supporting businesses, um, festivals and events, as well as the visitor and student growth. So we had a lot of feedback that that was exactly what people were expecting, but there was a pretty much a general consensus, consensus that people said, we make it shorter and a bit more succinct. Um, but then maybe you could provide more detail about those things underneath it. So either way, they're saying those sorts of things need to be in the charter, it's just where and how you might put it. So the first question we're asking you today um, really is in relation to 
those two options for a purpose statement that we'll bring back to you in a draft charter for your consideration in that first week of September. Um, the second um, area is the proposed powers, functions and duties of this subsidiary. So um, you can see on this slide that there is a number of areas that um, had a real emphasis in terms of what people were expecting this subsidiary to be able to do. Um, and it was very clear um, that whatever we were doing, they, they wanted us to not duplicate what others were doing, and they wanted us to work collaboratively with others. So with, for example, Renew Adelaide, or with the um, Adelaide Convention Bureau or Study Adelaide, not to do what they're doing, but to help support them. So that's why we've got that first one, uh, that first dot point about working collaboratively with state government and key stakeholders and our partners to deliver whatever our functions would be. So we're looking at putting that into the truck charter. Um, and then very, very strongly, we had um, people's feedback saying, we want you to market the city of Adelaide. You know, what, almost like that one voice, that one brand, that one destination so people don't get mixed messages. Um, and some people want to know more, a lot of people knew a lot about design, Adelaide Design for Life, others want to know more about it and how they could use it as well. So um, that was important. We had a really strong um, feedback, and you'll see this in the third dot point about we want to make sure we're supporting our existing businesses, particularly through these difficult times, but we also want to support new businesses, um, whether they are uh, and new industries to come into the city um, and that those should work together. And there might be different tactics for both, but both were equally important. Um, and in that, there was some discussion around, yes, and we would like you know, some support for entrepreneurs and um, you know, startups and that type of thing, but it was really more framed around that overarching for all, all businesses. Um, there was absolute agreement you know, that we continue and we need to position from the mall as the state's uh, premier retail and commercial pricing which uh, makes sense if we're obviously incorporating um, those duties in, into this subsidiary as well. Um, and then there was a lot of discussion around the, the really strong role that festivals and events play in the city, but also all the conventions and business activities um, play to bring uh, people interstate overseas to those types of activities where they'll spend more, they'll stay, have additional bed nights, spend more time here um, and that, that those types of um, activities help support existing business as well. And we've seen through that previous presentation you know, additional can obviously um, support existing businesses because of dollar spend and that type of thing. Uh, but there's equal support for the importance of international students as well uh, as those. There was varying discussion um, depending on which um, round table you're, you're in. Everyone thought it was important to support residential growth but there's probably uh, a different um, understanding of what that might do to drive other economic um, development in the city. So we had some sessions where we talked about um, the importance of residential growth to drive the nighttime economy, for example, that people aren't just leaving. Um, and then when those sorts of things got um, teased out by all the participants, then people say, oh yes, we do need to have more you know, residential growth and that this should be supporting that as well. But it probably was not, it was ranked important, but not as important as some of those other functions. Um, and then probably getting a bit more to the tactical types of things, there was um, a lot of interest um, about providing business capability and market research and insight. Again, we've just seen that before, um, to businesses and providing that to them so that it can help them um, make better decisions. So um, in addition to sort of the functions, we talked to them about, do you, do you think that there is um, a role for this subsidiary to be able to have secondary revenue sources, whether it might be you know, attracting sponsorships, um, whether it might be um, you know, uh, advertising or fees and charges, and there was definitely an interest in, in that um, power being written into the charter. There was also a lot of interest in, in terms of what do we even think the budget would be as well, which um, you know, we'll get to later. Um, and then a really important point was um, 
to retain that power for the Rundamal um, separate rate to be specifically expended in the area where it's taken. So there are the uh, powers and functions and duties that and the feedback that we received uh, in that. Some of the other things we put in the group said they're important, but they're the next lay down. They're just more tactical. You just do that when you're doing a business plan. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about um, a proposed board of management. So we, we put to all the round tables um, the range of skills that you can see there, right from economic development, brand marketing, public relations, so skills um, in sectors, right through to um, things like strategic management, financial management. So certainly everything on that left column was, in fact, everything was rate, rated as important, but the things that were um, perceived as less important were things like legal expertise, uh, digital disruption and, and change management. So you can see people really want to have um, a focus on skills that are relevant to what the, the functions and the purposes of this subsidiary would be. Um, we also heard very strongly, actually, we want a small board. We want a board that um, has a diversity of people. And we want a board that isn't all the same old, same old people. Um, they didn't say who those people were, but they said, we don't want the same people that we always see. Um, so we didn't have nominations or anything like that. But it was, you know, it was very clear that there was a support for that skills and experience. Um, and there was an idea, maybe we ought to also have creativity engagement skills um, on the board. That was something that had come up that didn't really get you know, um, much more traction um, beyond that one round table where people talked about it. Um, the, uh, on the basis of all of the feedback that came across in those five uh, different round tables, what we think we heard um, and what the uh, facilitator um, has put to us was that the chair should be a respected commercial leader, obviously with these types of skills. Um, absolutely that there ought to be a, a council member on, on this board representing the interests of council and that preferably that should be the Lord Mayor. Um, and then we heard about marketing brand, public relations skills, obviously business retail property representing those sectors. Um, put an entrepreneurial or startup perspective that might be, you know, those creative industries that are, you know, really emerging and the, and the growth of the future, um, but also making sure that you've got, you know, tourism and attractive skills on the board as well. Um, really um, interesting um, point was there, there was an appetite for a, a grassroots sort of business um, representative that may or may not be a precinct member. Because um, I guess the next thing that was really um, uh, interesting, and it was from both the precincts and uh, who were in one group and then across all of the others, um, I think someone said we ought to blow up the precinct model. What basic, that was one person's words, not everyone, but basically what people were saying is we recognise that the model that we have at the moment um, doesn't represent the 5,000 plus businesses that we have in the city and we maybe need a model that actually is more representative graphically so that it's you know, consistent, um, but, but um, that's not what we've got at the moment. But we didn't land on what that would be. Um, and if you look at the consultation um, uh, results, where we actually put different models of how they might be represented, everything, everyone was split, there was no consensus about what it ought to be. Um, and so one of the things that I have asked, it's not in one of the key questions um, for the charter, but um, there was an interest in, in terms of co-designing what a, a precinct model might look like, which can occur completely from the charter. If you've got something in the charter that's talking about having skills-based businesses um, on that, um, we, can, we could look at how we might um, uh, include uh, a mechanism in that charter for that engagement. But there was definitely, you can see on that next slide, um, an interest in terms of what that new model would be. Uh, no one, I think one person had a solution, um, but there wasn't consensus around that. But definitely that we need to support existing businesses, not all businesses in our precinct model. So that was a real uh, um, uh, attention. And I was surprised that even our other people in our precincts were saying, it's not necessarily the best model. So, um, 
The next um, slide is in relation to existing funding. So we did a little bit of work in, uh, in relation to how our marketing and um, economic um, development um, sponsorships, etc., are funded across the organisation currently. So all of our um, funding comes by general rates, not surprisingly. And then of course, we've got the random or separate rate. So in our current, just recently adopted um, integrated business plan, there's about $5.2 million for operational activities. So that's across what we call, and you would have seen these um, in the plan, city growth, festivals and sponsorship, and then all those strategic partnerships that we've got, so with the Bureau, Festivals Adelaide, Renew, Adelaide, etc. Um, and that 5.2 includes about $600,000 um, of staff costs, so it might be to administer um, the festival and the event grants and grants and those sorts of things. Um, in addition to that, there's about another $2.7 million of operating costs, which includes staff costs um, that contribute to economic development and marketing across the organisation. So we're talking through both of those. Uh, about 7% about of rates currently is spent um, on, on these types of activities. Um, that's completely separate, of course, to the $3.8 million that is collected for the express purpose of spending it on Rundle Mall under that separate um, rate. So that's just to set the scene so you've got a bit of an idea about what we're talking about our spend currently. And then in terms of um, funding options, um, we didn't actually ask people should we, you know, increase the your rates or should we give you another, you know, charge you with another separate rate because we just thought that there was no appetite for that and it would just be an inflammatory type of question. So we asked that question around should we look at other funding sources. Um, but the funding options that we do have, um, that which we would need to put in, into the charter, uh, we do have a general rate, um, which is obviously collected from all rate payers um, within the city based on your property's annual assessed value. And then of course we've got um, uh, a separate rate. So rate uh, funds that are collected specifically for a specific benefit. Um, so if there were any appetite, to increase a rate, have a new rate, there's a whole process to go through. And we're not suggesting that, but I thought it was important to put that on the table. The most preferred and I suppose most straightforward option um, for the subsidiary would to be an allocated percentage, say, um, of general rate revenue. Um, obviously that's up to up to council, but at the moment it's around about 7%. So just like putting that on the table in terms of that might be one way you go. Um, ahead. Um, and then importantly under that as well, if, if you're going to be amending the RMMA's charter team um, for the subsidiary or setting up a new subsidiary and um, having the functions that RMA, the Run the Wall Management Authority currently has in that, either way in terms of that charter, um, I would um, say you would want to keep that separate rate um, and obviously under the legislation has to be spent um, in that location, you couldn't just spend it you know, in Hart Street or, or, or somewhere else. So, yeah, so that's really our um, other question is, um, you know, council's feedback in terms of that funding um, option. So I'm going to leave those questions up there and, and ask if you've got any, I'm sure we have questions of me. Thanks for showing up, members. France, you're welcome to kick off. Is a bit of interest of mine anyway. Um, first, in regards to uh, the board, certainly the skills based, that's no question. Um, certainly, if, if there, there, I think there is some scope to have representation for uh, the stakeholders, but that can be uh, so, so certainly um, maybe framed in, in uh, skill sets, etc., that these board members would bring, because it is about uh, a high level of, of input rather than necessarily just having someone. I mean, a, a, a Lord Mayor is one thing, and a representative council, you know, that's a different reason in there. Um, but the other is certainly these people are here. Uh, enhance the actual uh, board, but also this is about quick translation of actions and activities uh, into those into those interest groups, and uh, so it isn't necessarily about 
representing a specific group, but it can be a, a, an individual, one or two individuals that can enrich it, and six to nine members should be able to give you that in that, uh, that scope. Now, in regards to income and things like that, I mean, what I noticed with the RMMA are that as well, and certainly you've got your, your suite of, of expenses you're already incurring, uh, activities you're already doing, which are customer facing and, and uh, uh, sponsorship and, and uh, promotion facing. So all of those sort of things are available now as part of that. It's just you're, you're managing it in a more independent way rather than necessarily through the actual organization. Um, but in that is also a lot of tactical uh, money. In other words, uh, this, this entity is creating a lot of uh, um, you know, activity, uh, direction and, and uh, ideas. But underneath that sits a lot of other funds that uh, uh, other stakeholders actually expend as well. And uh, that way they're going to get a lot more value. Because if, if we do this well, and this organization, and that's part of the purpose, um, they will be able to link into activities or whatever it is, and uh, use that to assist themselves to be a draw card in underneath the activities we're doing. And I think that's really critical. Um, certainly the rather more uh, funds at this moment, uh, if you're going to transfer their, cal their activity calendar, uh, as well as the funds of that, that way you already got, you already have something that's happening that can be translated. Um, sometime down the track, it can be then revisited and say, okay, how is it we need to do this? Because you've got your two main attractors in the city. I mean, the one is the everyday shopping, which is the, the central market sense. The other obviously is here. And in between you have all these others. And once each of them get a character uh, and, a, and a selling point, you can now evolve a conversation for each of those so that they all sort of blend in together and how they work together. Um, and there is a lot of opportunity, obviously, we talked about government and all the rest of the partnerships, so there's a lot of stuff we can do around that. Now, purpose of the communication, um, linking you know, uh, the economies together, and you know whether it be the, 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 the daytime, evening, and nighttime economies, but also, as you've indicated, all of the other influences upon the city. Um, part of the purpose, I think, too, is uh, you have all these activities that, that bring economic benefit, and, and you want each of them have to have space. Uh, including the precinct groups with how they function. So it should be that they um, work together, the calendar is then uh, worked through. Just finish, just finish your sentence, Ron. A couple more, or do I? Oh, oh. Oh, sorry, you don't want to do that? No, no. it's another minute. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll just rush it through. Okay, that's nice. Um, you know, and uh, uh, they need to have a strategic understanding of, of our advantages of the city and, and our weaknesses. Um, precinct groups, if they're bolted on in the sense of uh, they have there is the, the, the administration for them, and the administration works across the precinct groups, you can then they can then stretch out underneath and, and represent the areas or increase the size of the areas. But you have to be flexible because not all of them are um, uh, you know active. Some of them are a little bit less or more, and you want to give space to those that are more active and enable them to do better. And also, this is a way to channel activities onto the ground with people that are, are, are championing a particular space. I think it's important to do that and they can focus on that rather than the other. Um, leadership, certainly we are, the, uh, this city is, is the leader for, uh, you know, just in the entire greater city, but we also need to make sure that in you know, exactly that, that the person attracts that and, and uh, you know, uh, influences people coming in. And the rest of the investment and multi-purpose developments rather than just being apartments or or offices because these days are going to change. Right. Okay. Thank you, France. Members. Hello. Um, my understanding is that um, residential population is one of the most potent and significant uh, correlators of economic up uplift. Would that be true? So I probably uh, am not able to answer that from a professional point of view. I can certainly say that we we see it as a very significant contribution in terms of economic activity mm -hmm. uh, because you've got more people who are spending locally. You only have to yeah. look at what uh, the presentation we had early in terms of what we see happening in North Adelaide with people working from home mm -hmm. um, and, and in other symmetrical in Adelaide. So, so certainly as administration we see it as exceedingly important mm. but what I would say is not all of the round tables saw it as their number one priority. They all saw it as important but um, there were only a couple that actually said well that's really you know our most important priority. Okay. 
And it's not my area of expertise, hence the question, but I understood it to be one of the most um, potent and significant correlators with economic uplift. And therefore, I wonder to the degree to which the are really emphasising the message of the design for life, emphasising the message that this is the most livable city and how this entity would potentially be working toward that end in order to maintain and increase residential development in order to get the economic uplift that that achieves, as, as I understand it, one of the most potent ways of doing that. Um, so through the chair, absolutely, we, um, and maybe it's not clear enough in the purpose, but when we see um, investment attraction, mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about attraction for property development, for new development, so that we can house those people. Um, and that um, one of the functions that we had put out to them was increasing residential population. So we would, we had seen that within it. So we we could um, call that out more specifically in uh, the functions and the duties to make them very explicit. Mm. And I wonder to, and I'm, I'm asking the question whether this entity is doing that role, given in the past that has not been true. Um, if that is the intention, then to what extent? So we would be looking at identifying more of that data, i.e. I know there was a report that was circulated around council a little while ago from Deloitte Access Economics that looked at greening, you know, public transport, walking and cycling infrastructure, and identified how those were some of the, um, the key tasks from millennials who were, you know, aiming to attract the city to, to reside in the city, and looking at those in relation to driving the residential uplift and therefore, so not, you know, yes, we need to get the development done in the first place to ensure we've got the, the buildings sitting there for them to take up, but then actually attracting and maintaining the residential population and how much this entity would be um, looking at those factors to ensure we're not just putting on great events, but we're also creating a city that people want to come to and live in. Um, so I think, um, so, so absolutely what we heard and what we're intending is for that residential attraction mm -hmm. based on the um, differentiation that Adelaide has as a place to live, which does speak to our brand designed for life and, and health and wellbeing. We certainly heard um, that there is an opportunity in the midst of a terrible COVID crisis that we are seen as an international safe destination. We have heard and, and people talked about that there are you know, um, significant um, high wealth people who are looking at alternative locations that they could invest in. Um, so that came through in the workshops. In terms of what this, uh, the role of the subsidiary in delivering those, I think there would be a distinction between this, the subsidiary is promoting, hence the types of um, functions, those um, unique characteristics um, of the city <coughs> and the organisation of City of Adelaide um, through Clinton's area actually delivering that, that greening on the ground. Thank you. Lord Matt. Oh, sorry, through the chair. Yeah, just, just add to that a little bit. I think it's an important context there that the levers that the council has available itself for residential growth probably sit way beyond what this authority would, yeah, would be set up to do. Yeah. Um, if you look at our strategic property review, you look at the planning levers, you look at the things that really drive residential growth, the, the enablers, they probably sit more within the City of Adelaide uh, as a whole rather than necessarily the um, proposed authority. I guess though this proposed authority is very much a marketing authority. Yep. So to what extent, given the Design for Life branding, to what extent is this authority taking that over and or you know including that within it, within its branding or is that somewhat outside of the question? Back through the chair, it's a great question. And I think delineation, delineation of role, but in terms of the branding and how Adelaide is positioned as a place to live, would imagine that to sit more with the authority, the way it's positioned, but the actual levers to make it happen, probably more within planning and um, probably. No, that's good. So um, I get, uh, I'm just going to the funding of the subsidiary because um, I'm sort of 
interested in where funding sits. So um, in terms of things like the funding for festivals and events and strategic partnerships, um, I would think that that would remain with council to make those decisions and it would be with the authority to leverage those sponsorships and make sure that they're connected and networked as opposed to that money transferring over to the subsidiary to actually make those funding decisions. So if I can just get clarity on that. Yeah, back to the chair, another question. Um, it actually would be our understanding that council would be making those decisions. So the elected body would obviously be making decisions around both the strategic partnerships yes. as well as the events and sponsorship funding. But then in terms of the implementing, if you've got a three year funding agreement, for example, hypothetically with a festival or event or study Adelaide, how that gets leveraged would be through the authority. So the decision would come back to council. Okay. For um, so, and just, you know, um, from what Helen said, uh, I mean, many of the businesses said you don't need to do anything, just bring me more people and more people mean more residents in the area. So that, that is, you know, one of those fundamentals that uh, we have got some growth targets for the city. In terms of the, the page that you've got, which is slide 16, which is on existing funding, um, that's a sort of grab bag of everything that sort of sits there at the moment. I, I can't see how the City of Adelaide organisation will have no marketing or sort of um, operating costs around marketing because they'll still need to do their communications. So there's still going to be a communications role there. The 5.2 million, which is currently around city growth festivals and sponsorships, I, I probably need to, to, for myself to see how that's separated out so that I can see what portion goes into our sponsorships and strategic partnerships and what portion goes into what we call city growth at the moment um, and the staffing costs associated with that. And um, given there's 3.8 million, which is through the Rundle Mall separate, which would be still dedicated on, you know, promoting and marketing Rundle Mall. It's really a matter of how much more we need for the subsidiary to operate um, properly in terms of marketing and promoting the city. And if that is another, you know, etc., so that would, you know, be seven million in terms of operating costs, where that might come from. So. Um, so I, that's a bit muddy for me because 7% of general rates is, you know, $7 million coming straight off the top. But then we've got sponsorship and everything on top of that because that's already coming out as well. So that's a bit muddy for me in terms of the way that's presented. Um, so I'd be really interested to just get a separation of what will sit with council in terms of decision making and budget and what would sit with the subsidiary in terms of um, I think it's clear that it is a marketing body and I think the functions and things were also really clear. Um, uh, it's just how we might come up with that. I do actually, um, I'm keen to explore a differential rate as well. Um, um, or the other one for me is um, a percentage of the total of rates, but to me it wouldn't be 7%. So is what that percentage might be that is in keeping with the overall costs and in keeping with those other decisions in the budget, because otherwise we're double counting them. That's all. Um, does that make sense? Um, the, so in terms of funding off, I'm quite, having, I'm quite happy to have a look at a fixed percentage because I think that's probably the easiest way that we would do that in the same way that we did the climate um, for carbon neutral is a fixed percentage, then we know what the budget is uh, and it moves with our rates income and our revenue incomes. Um, incorporating the Rumble Mall, that'd be great. And um, uh, and also I do agree with the ability to uh, generate some revenue sources through grants and sponsorships and partnerships. Um, the, the draft purpose, powers and functions, probably with that addition in terms of how we look at uh, resi growth or city to city growth in terms of residential, uh, I think that would be good. And in terms of the composition and skill sets of the board, I think the only one that is still um, really whether we do a precinct or a, a grassroots business representative, I'm not quite sure what that means, but it's certainly we need business representation. That's 
my feedback. Thank you. Back, Robert. Thanks, um, Chair. Oh, I'm not sure why I'm flashing. Oh, I'm oh, right. that off. Yeah, it's a green light flashing at me. Sorry. That's, um, that's, that's good. Um, uh, thank you for um, for that. I guess um, my point is more around the composition of the committee. And I, I take on board um, you're saying in effect that the, you know the committee can't be everything to, to all people. I, I guess to build on Helen's point, my view would be in terms of position that it would be worthwhile having somebody from a resident um, representative in terms of you know the old saying that the cobbler the shoe, but only the wearer knows where it pinches. And if we're actually, these businesses are going to be um, reliant on residents um, in terms of being able to you know, sustain, sustain operations, particularly at this time, I think it would be useful to have a, a residential voice um, as part of the process. So, um, yeah, I, I'd suggest that's something to consider. Could perhaps make sure that, that at least several of those members of the board are residents. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As well as business owners or, or whatever. Good look at that. Members? Yeah. Um, look, I'm, I'm pleased uh, to hear that there's no uh, plan to blow up the precinct system because I think, you know, a, a lot of change at once um, is not likely to help the process. So keeping that structure in place is important, uh, not least because there is nothing to replace it. Um, and I think it is worthwhile having a representative of those precinct groups uh, on that board um, for a variety of reasons, not least of which would lead to uh, a better coordination of the activities across the city of what is principally the citywide business group. Um, however, the, uh, the funding I actually think this is a problem that always has been. Um, once you establish a body like this, um, which is relying on a rundle more rate levy to and its activities, you have created an expectation, at least among those who are being taxed, that is the Rundle Mall uh, um, rate payers, that they will have representation. And you're actually creating a committee that has a much wider brief, but which will be concentrating on their activities. But more particularly, you're then creating an expectation that those areas not covered by precinct groups are covered by the citywide business model. And even though they are not paying a levy, they will argue they are paying a greater rate and therefore they're entitled to some of the action. So you actually create all of these tensions from uh, rate payers, including those paying the rate, uh, the run more rate levy. Um, the, the precincts presumably will be happy because they're still getting their funding. So you actually are setting up um, a bit of a bun fight unless you resolve that funding issue of representation and the matter of Rundle Mall. Um, because you can't have a citywide business model that is going to be primarily responding to the biggest contributor, which will be the Rundle Mall uh, traders. That's, that's the problem. Uh, if it's replaced, however, with a, uh, a levy that extends beyond Rundle Mall, then that's another argument altogether, and, and that's a bigger fight. Um, um, you would have to have a, a really big discussion about that, about how far that goes, um, what are the geographical boundaries, um, and you certainly probably would want to think then very carefully about the model uh, based on the intention of that, um, that levy. So um, I'm pleased to hear the precincts are in place, and good luck with it. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. A um, couple of questions. Uh, being devil's advocate, um, what would there be to stop? We accept them because we accept the principle that uh, the um, central market exists as an authority in its own right because largely they 
is the owner and landlord, therefore, of that authority, and that the Rundle Mall Management Authority exists already uh, to uh, deliver a, a very prescribed um, mission to promote Rundle Mall as the state's premier uh, um, retail destination. What would there be to stop us contemplating a third um, section 42 entity that is that discharges this other larger set of, of uh, effectively precinct or village uh, place-based uh, geographically place segmented um, promotions and, and marketing um, is that something that has been contemplated um, through the chair thanks for the question councillor i think one of the challenges that's a little bit counterintuitive to to then create another body uh, and then you've got three bodies looking out in different parts of, of the city when the the, the intent and the, the things that we've heard through the feedback is how do you promote the city as a whole um, so you get away from the, the citywide component um, so i think that's again we, we've heard pretty loudly and clearly that there's a real appetite for uh, the section 42 fully owned subsidiary and that it has a whole of Adelaide approach. So it is the one voice for Adelaide. So I think to your question, it just sounds a little bit counterintuitive if you have a third. Um, again, through your chair, just to expand on my, 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 my thinking. The primary mission for the Rundle Mall Management Authority is to promote shopping in a geographic uh, location. Yes, there are some other bells and whistles, but largely it is a retail shopping centre with a big open sky. Um, is the the prospect of promoting the experiences that come with the different geographic parts of North Adelaide and and the South Adelaide City um, sufficiently? different in terms of how we construct narratives and the stories that we project um, to be in a sense for there to be a tension if, we, if, if one entity is trying to do all of it and there is one group of, of, of um, business operators and landlords who are um, property owners who are paying that levy for the purposes of promoting retail activity in that in that location it, it does just strike me that it bears thinking it, it bears asking um, this question and, and I'm very respectful um, and, and glad that um, Councillor Martin <coughs> has raised the, the issue of the of the precincts and you acknowledge in the in the piece uh, it's a really good piece of shit um, uh, that that the existing precinct boundaries don't cover the entirety of, of the city and therefore there are some some gaps um, for which there can be you know a fix um, um, it, it, it strikes me still that the, the the sell the pitch from a marketing perspective for Hutt Street precinct or Melbourne Street precinct, um, or a Connor Street precinct is going to be a different kind of pitch um, than Rundle Mall of necessity. Um, and I, I just, I, I would love to think that in our engagement, uh, and you know, we've acknowledged the uh, difficulty, I think either implicitly or, or, or explicitly uh, acknowledged the the challenge of reaching the thousands of, of businesses that aren't engaged in precinct uh, networks and, and activity, and their, the opportunity to participate in the in the engagement um, about this. And um, I, I, I only ask this because I, I think it's so important that we try and get this right. Really, really important because it's been in the past um, and. I don't think any of us would wish uh, uh, another uh, well-intentioned but fail uh, to be the outcome. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's more than that's, yeah. that's, that's just, just a comment. Is that a comment? More than happy to talk about that. Yeah. Simon? Oh, hold on. And Michelle, did you want to? You don't don't feel obliged to feel this fine. Just might just be a very so through the chair, just by way of more of an analogy, councillor. If you wanted to create a new event like a taste of Adelaide, for example, and you wanted to run it for four weeks, uh, sort of example where you'd have the uh, the, the differences of a, a North Adelaide offering versus a Hart Street offering versus a Chinatown offering versus a Highland precinct offering versus the Walls offering in that environment. So I think I've councillors mentioned this to me before trying to splice it more around themes rather than trying to splice it too heavily around um, geolocations. So that's that's definitely been part of our thinking about if you look about the next two, five, ten years, how you evolve out of this geolocation into more thematics and how each precinct can then bring that story to life, depending on what those stories will be. Simon? So, yeah, just a question, does you chair Michelle? Just like, like you, you did mention People prefer to have a small ball. Is that directly from those public consultation, or is it just my say the admin's idea? <laughs> sorry, sorry, through the chair. Um, so um, you you see in the consultation, which is linked, um, all of the comments. So people voted on different things and, and you know could pull a scale into what they preferred the most. But they also were able to put in comments, and you'll see through the comments. Um, that um, the participants have put in and that I didn't put in any comments, um, nor did any of the staff, um, that there, there was um, both in the discussion and in uh, which we have records of, um, but also in the written document that they were saying, um, you know, six to nine, a lot of people said six, people, uh, people said, oh, we need an odd number because you need to vote, uh, you know, and have, have a... Um, you know, preference. So it certainly wasn't um, administration. However, I do note in the um, report that I put up in June, I did suggest a small board. Um, so it does align with what my view is. However, this is what the, we heard from the round tables. The reason why I asked that is I actually find that a little bit strange that if you don't have the representative from each of the prison groups, what can we say like the, the, the president of each good to get on the ball, hence like it's just like another body that telling what the prison should do, kind of like over manage it. I'm not sure whether or not that is what we want though. Good point. Good point. Good point. Good point. Do you want to comment on that? Um, I think um, there was a variety of views. Um, so it's really important to know that it wasn't just precinct groups we spoke to. We talked to people like the convention centre, you know, a destination in itself of hundreds of thousands of people talking about a city attractor. So we had feedback from people like the, I'm not saying they said that, but people like the convention centre, the zoo. Um, so we have big attractors who want to see Adelaide as a destination, um, as which has obviously precincts within it. But the, the approach to this city is, um, in my view, is not about a group of precincts. We have precincts. It's about having Adelaide um, with one united voice, whether it's the zoo speaking, whether it's Hutt Street speaking, whether it's Rundle Mall, whether it's our property sector, um, all saying this is what Adelaide's offering is, come to Adelaide, and that, in, that important voice of being united. So, so um, there was there was certainly a very strong focus on having a skills based board who understand that rather than it necessarily being a board representing all the precincts. In fact, I would say that the feedback was the opposite of that. Right, but my other concern is because, like, really, like the precinct groups are very much like providing all those grassroots information that like what people from the bottom i mean like they go to small business and uh, the small business traders and also like those residents that really want I mean, really want to see the city to become like, what kind of place the city will become all right so i understand that there are some other big organizations that share different wheels and they, they do have they do i mean they do have the right to have their say all right but i think we should really not forget 
the importance of each of the precinct groups who represent those people, I mean, either residents or small business people. Uh, yes, look, um, I'm a fan of the subsidiary. I, I can see what you're trying to say, but it seems to be adding another layer of bureaucracy. Um, as Simon said, it won't be representative unless it's quite large. So I think when somebody said there's an overbound funding support of this, you can count me out. Um, I think this will eventually replace the precinct groups, and I think that's what it's aiming to do. Um, we are the council. You're supposed to be the business representatives of your wards. Um, well, well, you don't want to do anything. Uh, so I'm not for it at all. I guess um, not. Uh, anyone's got different viewpoints. I think there's a long way to go um, in regards to this and what the structure will be and what the roles will be and all of that. But um, I do. A, I'm, I am. I'm not clear on the funding as well, so I wouldn't mind, you know, more information in regards to how you would think this would be um, viable for it to be funded. Because I'm not really understanding how. It just seems like it's really double dipping. Respects, and um, I want more clarity on that um, going forward. But I mean, everything else. I mean, we're all in agreement. I believe, you know, by the sounds of it, that precinct groups should have some sort of um, presence within the model. Um, and uh, I understand that fundamentally, this is, you know, what because I've sat in and a lot of the, the the consultations that you had, and they are screaming for a change. They want to change and and to, you know, not. Live to the public um, and not, not responding is to what they want is the worst thing that we can do and you know this is something that people are calling for in wanting to have a change within the city for it to be marketed in a way that represents the city as a whole rather than in separate parts so I, I listened a lot to what they were saying and I do get that however you know it has a bit of work I get I get that as well. The setting up of the board looks all fine, of course, you know, that will be a lot of work, but I'm still not very clear about the funding and I still need more clarity on that. Members? Hello? Just, uh, just a quick point on the board appointments. I, um, uh, I, I agree and note what you guys have said in the report around skills, experience and expertise. Um, I think that there is a place for these precinct groups or communities somewhere, but um, personally, I don't think it's on the board because the board has uh, oversight and governance of the uh, of the subsidiary. Um, in terms of engagement, that's probably where you would get your um, precinct groups involved and. Um, I guess get them to provide feedback or to channel information through them so that they can give that information to, to the businesses because as Simon said, um, these precinct groups know their, their businesses, they know their communities, they they know exactly what's um, what's going on in their communities and what's needed. So in terms of board appointments, I, I see that as um, uh, as a body that, that has oversight. Of the uh, of the subsidiary, but um, yeah, the, I think for me the engagement piece will be the important part. The engagement with the with the precinct groups, and that's not necessarily on the board. Thank you. I'm just I am actually keen to understand a little bit more about um, slide 15, which talks about uh, co-designing a new precinct model that represents all the city businesses. Now, what that relationship might be with a new subsidiary. Um, uh, because I do think there's an opportunity for the precinct groups themselves to come together in some form and then uh, if there is a representative of the precincts on the board that they elect that precinct in the way that the friends group from the festival which are the main ticket buyers and the consumers of the festival uh, have their own organisation and an AGM which they elect a member to sit on the board so it's it's um, 
it, it might be a way, and I'm really keen to understand what the precinct's response to that was in terms of, um, again, the feedback was really clear and, and the forums that I sat in on were very clear that they actually want to relook at how they're doing things as well. So um, whether this gives us an opportunity to work with the existing precincts, bring in more city businesses, but have them to have a really clear line um, of sight and representation on that board. Is there anything else that, other than what's in the papers that you could share with us on that? Um, through the chair, so certainly this, this is what we've heard, is that they need to be involved in terms of what the precinct groups might look like. So, um, and, and that came from the precincts themselves. They, they you know, yeah. You know, every precinct group is a creation of, you know, the willing who have wanted to come together. So it was very clear that we need to and continue to have that very close communication backward and forward, um, but that um, they want to think about how it might connect with the board. So we did put up a, 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 you know, a model which um, was having, you know, you could have representatives from all the precincts um, and they'd be, or it could be a subcommittee um, and that, you know, uh, it would elect who was going to be on the board. That was one option. Um, you know, other options could be that, um, you know, you report into the board in, you know, each quarter and you, or you report back. But it's really, really what you heard is, the information flow is critical, both down, they want the data and the information, but also up yes. to help inform what um, we're aware of. So um, we can come, you know, come back with something, but I think the point is they want to be involved, not to have something put on them, they want to be involved in what else it might look like, and are very keen just generally to make sure if we're going to make this change, let's make sure it works. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Um, I, a few months ago, I, I was doing a lot of listening, a lot of uh, talking um, and listening. Um, and the uh, Adelaide Business Collective Committee, who aren't the presidents, I understand that, and who, who are endeavouring to have over the last couple of years, 18 months thereabouts, um, I believe, uh, sought to contribute to the thinking around the citywide business model. Um, I think the, the feedback I've had most recently, uh, which is very you know, grateful and encouraged uh, by the, the work that um, our administration that you guys have been doing, um, uh, they highlighted that there were a couple of areas that they're still hoping can be addressed in the journey. Um, uh, it's not so much about the outcome, but addressed in the journey. Um, the council administration uh, proposed a reference group be formed uh, to shape the final model. Um, and they, they, that group were very supportive of that. Um, and that they also were keen to advocate a final workshop to guide the model forward. And, and I believe they could have conveyed that um, to, to, to you as well, um, that the, the opportunity to co-design, the, the the opportunity to co-design is important because the existing precinct model as which doesn't reach enough of the four thousand plus um, the businesses. Uh, just a quick question. Well, what does the Adelaide Business Collective think? I mean, what's their view? I know they were pretty annoyed that the city might run this or it might report in some way to the city. Have they got an updated view? I'm not sure you mean, sorry, about the, the city might run at all. Oh, they were uh, uh, disconcerted about this being uh, subsumed into the subsidiary model, uh, that there still was a connection to the run wall. That was the correspondence I was getting. Have they changed their where, where are they now? So, so I think um, Councillor Mackey looked really what I've heard from them um, yeah. is around um, a reference group yeah. to shape what the model is. So that's yeah. that's exactly what I've heard right. from okay. them in um, I've seen some correspondence more, more yeah. recently. Yeah. Yeah. So that's exactly what I've heard. And I suppose you know for elected members, the 
that it's that inherent tension between we've consulted, do we want to do more consultation, who would be on the reference group, what would that mean, and, and the tension of that versus what's the time frame you want this to be undertaken. So yeah. that's really a matter for council to um, decide, do we want us to undertake more consultation? Members? I'll just make a couple of remarks oh. and questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's tough going last. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> first up, <laughs> first up, um, I think when, 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 when this was first presented, there was a little bit of I don't know, it was presented, presented as an economic development agency. And I think, first of all, you need to decide what you're going to do exactly so that you can do it as best you can. Um, if it is economic development, then I do take Helen's point entirely that residential growth needs to factor more heavily into it. I'm not suggesting you go and build buildings yourself, but um, uh, you need to factor that into, into, into what it's doing. And at the same time, then, even if it is just a marketing authority, um, uh, you're, you're, you're advertising the city, you want people to come and live in the city, you should be, and there's no reason you can't if it is just a marketing authority, but plugging in to existing developers to, you know, have a page on the website and promote, you know, if you want to live in the city of Adelaide, these, this is sort of what you've got to choose from, this is what's nearby, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, I think that would be valuable if we want to attract residential growth. Um, uh, but yes, is it an economic development agency? Is it just a city marketing authority? I didn't realise that's that funny, but thank you. I'll take whatever I can get. Um, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or is it is it as well? You know, when we're talking about citywide business model, I mean, if it's just for marketing, you almost don't need a representative on there. But it, it, I think there is. It wants to be more than that, and it is going to end up being more than that. So, um, uh, I guess uh, business representation, I think, is integral on the board. Um, I think you've heard it, obviously, but. Um, I, I don't think that should be a precinct group per se, or that all precinct groups should be represented on the board. I think that is entirely unworkable. Um, uh, I, I don't um, agree with the idea that we'll be doing away with precinct groups entirely. I don't think you should. I don't think you actually can. You start. You can't stop people coming together and and talking about their, you know, their their business neighbourhood. Um, uh, what I do think there should be a representative on the board that. Um, one way or another, every business in the city gets a say on who that is. Now, if that's all businesses that you've got enrolled get to vote online or, or something like that, um, I think there needs to be engagement with the businesses in what the process is. I think there needs to be engagement with the businesses and what the process is. And I think by doing that and engaging, you'll actually get buy-in and you'll actually generate some interest in what you're doing. You'll generate more um, uh, more foot traffic to your your resources, the things that you've got to offer your businesses. So I think um, uh, that's integral, and I do take that point from the Adelaide Business Collective um, entirely. That uh, that you know, it's also about building a community, and the businesses are engaging with one another, also collaborating, swapping ideas, and what have you. And that's an integral part. In an well, that's what the precinct groups would be, but in reality, they're volunteer-run organisations. And just as your local Lions Club has only got a handful of people in it, your precinct group has now only got a handful of people in it as well. And by all means, they do a fantastic job. But um, uh, when it comes to that, I think also the there should be. I like this idea that's exactly on the screen in front of us. Um, uh, a sort of a committee. I think groups would be engaging directly and the agency, whatever it may be, um, so that information can go up and flow down. I think that's that's really integral, so that should be the chair of each, of each precinct group. Similarly though, and this is the crucial part, they need administrative support. When I say administrative support, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that someone in the agency sits above them and tells them this is what the agency is doing. I'm suggesting someone in the agency sits below them and assists them in achieving uh, sort of the plan set out by the board. Yeah. So you've, you've got, you've got, because that's what's, what's lacking, the professionalism. And most of the money that we give the precinct groups, they spend on paying a coordinator anyway, because they're too busy running their business to run the activities of a, of a volunteer organisation. They need to professionalise, and that's what this board, or this what this structure should be able to do. So it's not something that's sitting above them, it's sitting below them to support their activities. And it probably will need to be more than just one person, probably a couple of people. 
to my mind. Um, and they help them roll out. So we're going to do a Valentine's Day promotion. That'll look different from how it looks in Chinatown. You know, how do we tweak that? You know, the citywide business model will promote it, but how do we tweak that and personalise it? So um, other than that, business representative uh, is important for accountability. Um, uh, and we do not want this to turn into uh, a citywide RMMA where people feel that they're not being consulted on what's happening. Um, and I also think through that engagement, you will throw up naturally issues with council and there should be able to be that to and fro so that if there's a policy issue, whether it's, you know, some other red tape or what have you, um, uh, the, the agency can convey that to council and it can be dealt with. Um, and I also think it should be sort of quarterly, quite comprehensive quarterly reporting to council and committee. Um, uh, currently, our subsidiary is coming once a year, that's just not enough. Anyway, um, thank you, members, for your indulgence. Is there any other points? No? Okay, thank you. We'll go on to 4.3, which is, uh, again, Michelle, don't go anywhere. Um, climate Ready City. So, um, uh, a little while ago, um, council. Oh, let me speak. A little while ago, um, council um, basically um, resolved that we've been doing a good job for twenty years. Um, that um, that was you were supporting um, what we were currently doing, but then you asked us to investigate new opportunities. Um, beyond the current budget cycle when it was the last budget um, to ensure Adelaide is climate ready and heat prepared, including improving water resilience and ensuring an equitable distribution of greening in city streets. So the presentation today and the questions we've got, I've got for you today are really around those, those three key parts. So um, you'll see in your pack um, that we've talked a lot about what we're already doing. So you understand what we're already doing in those three areas. Um, and then we put up some proposals to continue doing some of those things, but also to ask you about some other ideas. Um, and so they are around um, how we tackle urban heat and help um, our community with urban heat, our business community and our um, residents and our visitor community as well. Um, how we improve our um, water resilience. Uh, and then also um, around increasing greening. And not surprisingly, these align well with what our strategic plan is um, in any event. So I'm very keen um, to hear what elected members' views are, whether you're interested in scaling up existing initiatives, delivering new initiatives, or actually whether you've got um, additional initiatives that we haven't put on the table for you. So um, going straight to what I'm going to take it as red in terms of what we're already doing. So going um, straight to what potential future options um, there might be. So um, we have been doing a lot with our community. Some of you might have attended the um, Feeling Hot 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 event. Um, events like we've um, done um, a business event, we're helping businesses. Um, so what we were um, looking at in terms of future options is really um, breaking down to a couple of areas. So actually helping our community to be um, uh, heat prepared. Um, the second one is actually looking at poor materials. So not just but materials can actually make a difference on the heat um, that you're experiencing. So they give up different heat signatures and uh, all the work we did um, as part of Resilient East um, really showed the difference uh, differences in um, temperatures of different materials. So we've got there things like we did a cool rise trial, but looking at cool um, materials in terms of our footpaths or roofs, building materials, street furniture, for example. We had a citizen science um, initiative where we actually had people in the community with heat guns going out and measuring the differences in different materials, you know, a seat here and um, a pole there and that type of thing to and that helped um, inform what we um, suspected um, as well. So, um, and importantly, ensuring that our asset management plans consider the um, impacts of climate change and increasing heat um, on, on them as we plan as well. Um, 
very much linked to being a water sensitive city is um, and making um, good decisions with our water um, is of course the, the role in water for cooling as well. So some things we've put to um, you is you know obviously um, considering um, using more water, water sensitive urban design uh, in our um, public realm um, so that we get that uh, low cooling. Um, we've got some of these types of um, installations in the city already uh, using water misting. So, um, you know, the idea of festivals, events, in the run of war, obviously we have very hot summers. It's something we have actually implemented, uh, been looking at in terms of the great heavy flying box down at Botanic um, Park because it actually can reduce the mortality. Um, and in the same way they're affected by heat, humans are affected by heat as well. Um, and then obviously continuing to partner um, with um, organisations like the University of Adelaide, SA Water, to um, really look at what else we can be doing. Uh, we have also um, more recently been um, uh, looking at what we could put in for state government funding that will award a sensitive grant as well, so we'll continue to do that. In terms of um, water sensitive city, um, you can see we have already done a lot in relation to water sensitive urban design. Um, but some of the other things we could look at um, are, are things like installing curb inlets so we're storing that water um, better, um, looking at the use of permeable paving on footpaths, um, and continuing to um, apply for grants from the, the state government. Mm -hmm. Um, so, the last couple of years we've also installed some um, smart water meters um, and it's been really, uh, it's probably really important for Council to know actually that as a result of that and um, the work that one of my team does with our um, water inventories, we actually are, are not only finding um, opportunities to improve our water resilience, but we've actually found very significant cost savings for the organisation. So um, just in the last, about a year ago, uh, we found um, a billing error from, from SA Water and as a result we saved over $100,000. So these types of technologies actually save water, where they can detect leaks and things, but we can also you know, verify our bills and things like that as well. So we'll continue to do, um, we're looking at continuing to do that type of thing. Um, uh, in, in addition, um, we obviously have a, um, a budget um, set aside for looking at the Torrens, uh, Torrens Lake for wetlands, um, but it's also considering things like, uh, you know, other wetlands in other parts um, of the city as well. Uh, and then finally on to greening options. Um, so, you know, we could possibly develop a long-term greening plan. So not having an ad hoc approach greening, but saying, look, let's think about, you know, trees are an asset, they can have lives of over 100 years. Um, you know, why don't we develop a, a plan that's actually thinking about our city, where where is the equitable greening, but, but actually giving our assets team the ability to think, we know when they're doing renewal, that in this area there's a priority, or priority for greening in this area, because it's, it's already fine. Um, so we've talked about possibility for um, strategy, um, but then of course to continue to pilot alternative green infrastructure um, options where we've got competition underground and we can't get a tree in, looking at alternatives in terms of um, green screens, um, green walls, green roofs, that type of thing. Uh, and then um, looking at ways we can continue to partner um, with state and um, uh, federal government around those green opportunities, but also engage our community. We do have some community engagement in, in our park plans um, already around some of our biodiversity assets, um, but we could look at some community initiatives so that they can um, assist us in greening and, and also to those green targets. So it's a quick summary um, and I'll just leave it to, to you to provide some feedback. Fabulous, thanks Michelle. Uh, Rob. Thanks Chair and um, thanks very much uh, Michelle for the presentation and um, for the um, 
uh, suggestions and the work that's already been done as well was great. And I thought all of the suggestions were excellent. So I think we should do all of those. It looks, um, looks terrific. Um, yes, I agree with the um, idea of having a long-term um, plan in terms of greening streets. And indeed, I think that was envisaged with the Greener Streets program back in 2015, was that there was sort of that initial um, injection of greening on city streets. And then I think there was always a hope that there would be some longer term work done. So I think that would be really good. I guess the only rider I would put on that is I think there is still some pockets of the city that have been neglected in terms of greening. And I would hate for a plan like that to be sort of akin to a master plan process where it kind of sits in a drawer um, so I think we should definitely do it, but I also think I'd love to see during this coming budget cycle um, some prioritisation of greening in areas that have been neglected, particularly in residential. And I'm thinking in particular of the City West area where I, I know there are huge path pockets of the city that are actually um, you know, pretty barren in terms of greenery. Um, and the residents there through the Weaver Group um, and others have been advocating really long term for some love in council's um, greening budget. And I think we can be creative in terms of how we do that. I recognise in some of those streets it's not actually possible to plant trees because of the configuration of the underground. But looking at some of those other um, options I think would be really good. Um, I also see that ramping up the greening work as being really critical for um, Council's work in terms of reducing emissions, which was the you know, key thrust of that original motion, I think, around taking urgent action on emissions, particularly if we've got you know, things like uh, car month and others that are going to bring more uh, cars into the city, potentially increase congestion and carbon emissions. Um, we need to really um, think of what we can do to um, offset that. Um, and you know, I think more greenery is um, really very important. The other thing um, I put on the radar is um, the um, uh, use of gas. Um, well, it's not mentioned in any of this work, but I know that as part of the um, city's response to COVID-19, there has been outdoor heat using gas and stuff like that being provided. Um, understand the rationale uh, for that in terms of being able to support people having outdoor dining and so on. But, you know, there are lots of use of gas and the impact on the um, environment and I think that does sort of undermine some of council's work when we're trying to reduce emissions and then we're giving out gas you know gas heaters so I think it'd be worth um, thinking about uh, some of those things as well in terms of council's response um, longer term but I think all of the the ideas that are being suggested um, are really good the final point I'd make is it would be excellent to see some sort of um, volunteer-based initiative to get people out there doing tree planting, you know, tree planting month or, you know, whatever, but something that is really, you know, getting people out there um, doing that. I think there's a lot of community interest in that um, work and particularly as we're, you know, gradually getting out there a little bit more once restrictions are easing, I think that would be a really beneficial thing to do in the city. Um, and then second. Thanks, Jen. Just a, a couple of um, quick points. <clears throat> to uh, Councillor Sim's point around greening, yes, I have been advocating for um, uh, greening in the northwest of the city because I think that uh, that um, precinct is essentially turning into a concrete jungle. So uh, I understand the challenges that uh, we do have in those uh, tiny little streets. Uh, you can plant a tree, but it will probably die a month or two after you plant it. So I understand that. So I, I do know that we need to be um, a little bit more creative when it comes to greening. Greening doesn't necessarily mean planting a tree, um, but I do note that uh, in the budget, I think we had um, uh, just under a million dollars that was uh, dedicated to uh, um, uh, designing uh, greening projects and initiatives uh, in that northwest of the of the CBD. So that's a that's a good start. The design's a good start. Uh, hopefully, the uh, the bill will come through um, after that. Um, one quick question I did have was uh, uh, around the Adelaide Design Manual. Does that need to be reviewed or adjusted or changed to take any of this uh, into account? 
Um, so, just so you know that we sought grant funding um, through for the Northwest um, through the Greener Neighbourhoods Program, and if successful, um, we've asked for two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, and that would deliver thirty-six new trees in five streets, and importantly, increase canopy from four to twenty-four percent. I mean, obviously, as these trees grow, which. So when we're talking about those partnerships, that's that's what we're looking at doing. Thanks, Michelle. Through the chair, yeah, so further to that, um, the Adelaide Design Manual has a chapter that uh, that corresponds to greening in the city. Um, it is under review at the moment, uh, particularly around some of these issues coming through. Um, and you're right, it does need to be reviewed in light of how we can actually obtain more green planning in areas of the city where there is a lower canopy cover. Um, just to further to that point as well, we can foresee in the near future that there is going to be a threshold limit as to how many trees we can currently fit into those, into those streets based on their current land use and function. So what we need to come to council with is maybe some alternative ideas around the land use and the function of some of those streets to incorporate more greening. So that, that's the type of longer term view that, that Michelle and the team are thinking about. We can see the horizon and we can see that there's naturally going to be a limit to the amount of physical trees we can fit in some streets. Yeah. Oh, so that, uh, if I may, just a follow up question. Um, uh, the review of the Adelaide Design Manual, is that an operational matter? Does that come back to council or not? Uh, through the chair, it's it's not necessarily a council approved document. Yeah. It's a, it's a guideline. Yeah. Um, that's probably where it currently sits for me uh, in terms of uh, its use operationally. There is some work for us to do around um, costing some aspects of the Adelaide Design Manual. So we, what I'd like to bring to council is a clearer picture of what some of those um, uh, design guides uh, actually cost so that um, council can make some really good decisions and sound decisions around some of the choices in that manual. So that's the thinking at this point in time. Just, um, actually no, I'll wait to the end. Purpose? Sandy, and then Phil. Um, I think, I hope I got this right, but I'm sure I saw, saw something on my same water bill that said two hours of misting is equal to one minute in the shower. So it's uh, like it was extraordinary yeah. to the point that I photographed it and sent it to my kids. Um, so, you know, in terms of misting, um, you know, and we used it uh, with events particularly. Um, why made, for instance, where there was always misters when the temperature was going to go about 35 degrees. Um, and so I do think that they would be great to have a look at how we might incorporate some of that into the city. Um, the Cool Roads projects, I'm really keen to see the outcome of the Cool Roads projects and get a, a clear understanding of how and when to use that and whether that is something that the state government will also use. Um, those initial tests we did, Michelle, when we went out and launched that was between two and 10 degrees difference um, off the surface. And if we can take, if we can reduce the heat in the city by 10 degrees mm -hmm. off the stuff coming off the bitumen, particularly at night, um, that's going to make a huge difference to the cooling in the city. And, and uh, as far as I know, the coatings were um, fairly robust. So I'd be very keen to understand when the results are coming through and what we're going to do. Would you like to answer that one? And I've got a couple more quick ones. Oh, I'll perhaps answer first. Okay. Um, so uh, we're getting those results this month. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, we're holding a webinar on Monday. So it was with Climate Key, yeah. Department Environment, Water um, and ourselves. So we're holding a webinar on those results. Um, so to give you an indication of the interest that the community has in this, we thought maybe we'd get 40 people. We're well over 100 now who are wanting to participate in that webinar. Um, and um, it's, it's still growing. And that's without having done a whole lot of um, promotion for it. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I um, I do the canopy in the um, northwest and the south. Sorry, 
northwest, yeah, and southwest of the city has come up several times, and I brought that into the chamber, I think, last term as well. Um, so I'd really like us to look as a priority in terms of um, increasing that canopy, um, almost before we actually look at the other canopy increases, because um, that will go a long way to changing how those areas in the city are. Um, so well, I think you answered some of that with the funds that you... So, so we are for um, North West, we are actually already, my team, um, actually parts of Clinton's team are already looking at the South West, North West and Northern CBD and have identified some potential um, locations for new street tree planting. So that's along Curry and Franklin Street Medians, the Perunor, Wilkes Square, Byron Place, Grady, Crother. So we are already looking at that to your point. These are very important. Um, and, um, and also, I, I know that in terms of um, engaging community, so through APLA, uh, we, we have been approached uh, for a, a, a volunteer group to actually do something in part, I think it's part 22, Clinton, is it part 22? Um, which is where the old... Um, um, next What's up? Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. So um, understanding that we don't have anything in our budgets to remediate that area, um, we've been approached by a, a volunteer group through APA to work with us to look at how we might green that. So those sorts of things are sort of in train at the moment. So um, we're working through that at the moment to how we might facilitate a fairly large community um, involvement in greening some of that space. Um, yeah, so, yep, all of those. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mary, then Phil. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think this is really great, this piece of work that you have given us this report. It's really um, setting the, the tone to that we need to pay or what we need to do further work in this area. Um, uh, I mean, I like the um, idea of using um, other materials. Um, I mean, the greening, of course, we all agree that we want more trees, um, but in some places that's difficult to do. And I would like to explore more of using materials that can cool, um, cool down the um, cool down the area. The other thing is um, uh, what I haven't heard talked about is uh, rooftop. I mean, do we do any? work in that area in encouraging some greening on rooftops as well. Um, could we um, be leaders in that area in um, using our car parks, greening the outside of our car parks, and uh, showing you know, businesses what we, uh, other developers and what we can do. I know we've talked about it, but I don't, I haven't seen it mentioned in, in here in, in what way we can do more in that space. Um, I know that I understand that we can get community groups, we can get involved, we can plant more in the parklands, we can we can use material, but I think the other bit of calling can come in on the buildings that we currently have um, already. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say at this point. Phil? Um, yeah, look, um, it, it's been touched on briefly that um, greening is always dependent on uh, underground services, footpath width and so on. But there are substantial areas of the city, residential areas too, um, where we are not able to green. And uh, you know, we ought to actually be looking for solutions to green areas where underground services, footpath width, and other impediments prevent us from doing so. And, and there must be innovative solutions from other parts of the Australia or the world. But it, it's, uh, you know, and I can name many streets in North Adelaide where there are trees for a distance, then they stop and it's back to concrete. Um, and, and there must be a way around that. And? Uh, yes, um, first question. Um, Michelle, what happened to this? Uh, what happened to the sky gardens that I've moved twice now on two sort of things? Seems some Sometimes these greening ideas just get motions on notice are uh, relegated to. You don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> Sorry. Scar, um, sky Gardens. Sky Gardens. Oh, Sky Gardens. Sorry. Honestly, I had to move it twice because it was put on the back burner, top of our bus station, anything. Sounding familiar? Yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, Why are I, I, I missed yeah. the word and I wasn't sure. Yeah. I mean, these are lovely to talk about them, but there have been initiatives repeatedly put up by councillors 
um, who after all are the council, and they never get any traction. And while this sounds lovely, um, you get a bit sick of it after a while. So when are the Sky Gardens going to be looked? Are they mentioned in this body of work? And why aren't they mentioned in this body of work? Uh, so through the chair, um, yes, so we did um, across the organisation uh, investigate the opportunity for all of our own assets. Mm -hmm. I think it was to have a community, to have community gardens on our um, on, on top our, of our bus on top of our assets, that's mm -hmm. correct. Um, I understood a report to come back to council around what some, or perhaps it was an e-news, I can chase it up for could you. I, could I now say to the CEO, e-news is not an efficient way to communicate with me. And we've said that often. It is your job to communicate with us in a way that we're comfortable with. And my managers have said e-news is something you do not work with. So could I have that included in any further reports that we look at the motions, the many, many green motions that have been put up, and at least give us the decency to, to investigate them, not fluff them off to e-news. Uh, the only other thing I want to say is um, be very careful with ministers. They're very dangerous for legionnaires to service. Yep. Yep. I won't be changing my shower head over then. Oh. Sorry, no, 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 it's not to that be seen the shower. No, that, I, 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 I know, know. It, was, and it was tongue in cheek. Uh, 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 members? Hello? Um, just following on for the, from the comments that you were making earlier about um, capacity of street trees in some areas, does, is that inclusive of planters or is it exclusive of planters? Like in terms of achieving that street can canopy, could that be achieved with plant boxes or that's, exclude, that's including the option of planters? Um, so um, in some situations planters are an option, in others um, it might not be for accessibility. So there's definitely a solution in, in some locations, but not all locations. And is that in terms of increasing the street canopy, is that being looked at as well as a widespread option to particularly within some of those areas that have the current lack to rather than sort of look at it when a street gets redesigned to look at that as an option to roll out more widely when street trees can't go into the ground? Uh, through the chair, yeah, absolutely an option. Um, different consideration though with the with the planter boxes. The, there's a limit to the tree height. There's a limit to the canopy. Yeah, there's a limit to the tree not, age. Not so we just not. need to take that into take that into consideration. Obviously, a tree in the ground is a much healthier, much better situation. Um, you would see that we've used the planter box scenario around spotted around the, the city. Um, we can definitely look at that in more residential locations mm. of the city as well as an option. It seems as though that advice, otherwise if that's the case, as though that the planters tend to get used more as a street design option when a specific street is being put forward for design and that's the, the last resort but that goes up rather than looking at areas that could get that coverage and looking at rolling them out more widely and I appreciate it's the worst outcome, it would be better to put them in, but I'm just wondering whether, yeah, that had been looked at to try and roll them into areas a little bit more consistently where it's the only option or the best option. Um, so through the chair, so so the idea of actually having a, a strategy would be to overlay what's, we know what the current canopy cover is, but overlay that with heat mm. in terms of where the challenges are and then prioritise which are the areas we need to look at, which which hasn't been the approach we've had. It's we're, we're, do, we're doing an upgrade of this street and, and we're focused on that rather than we're actually saying that greening is important project in itself. Yeah. So um, we, we can look at that and that would be something we would look at if we we're going to do a stretch. And Chair, I, regrettably, I have to leave, um, so apologies for that. I have a convening committee. But thank you, everybody, for the discussion. If there are no hands, I'll just have a couple of questions. Clinton, is, um, we're talking about space for greening and trees and such. Um, is looking at alternative land uses, is that code for removing car parks or just putting more trees or what? Uh, through you, Chair. No, not necessarily. No, not necessarily. Okay. Um, what are the no, sort of land uses in question? Um, 
it's about consideration of the available council land. So boundary to boundary, um, we, there's a certain amount of infrastructure we have to fit within that boundary to boundary width. Um, there's footpaths, there's stormwater infrastructure, there's laneways, there's bikeways, there's parking, there's you know the associated infrastructure. It's probably just looking at that and identifying where there are opportunities um, for trees to go into that space. So not necessarily a change in, in land use. It could be in certain circumstances. Um, it could be um, reducing streets at one travel of direction, potentially. Um, that's been done in some streets across the city. Um, it's part of an overall strategy that we would have to look at. But they're the types of things that could open up opportunities for, for green down the track. Okay. Um, like you just want to get this a little hard on. But um, uh, I suppose just on a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I like Phil's point uh, about alternatives. That was something that actually Helen and I looked at with, um, what's the name of that street? You know, the little one? Vincent. No, there was the other one near, Stevens. The, near the Stevens. Yeah. And we tried to work with, tried to really encourage, um, I can't remember who, but the administration to think about, okay, we can't plant a tree, but there must be something else we can do that's green that we can put in. Um, and so I don't have the answer right here in front of me. I think what we stuck in Gawler Place, I don't know how much that actually cost, but you know that idea is a good idea. Um, uh, that individual component, as in the tree, looks slightly over-engineered, but I'll leave that to the engineers. Um, uh, so yeah, th there are definitely alternatives out there and I would strongly, strongly encourage you um, to look at them and bring them back to us and you look at rolling them out because when you, you've got competing land uses, some innovative ways of greening um, uh, would be desired. Uh, when we're talking about urban heat, obviously that's one way to tackle it. I think we were, <sighs> got the city of Adelaide boundary, but the urban, the heat island effect you know, does not end at the gutter of the parklands, the outer gutter of the parklands. I think we need to look at uh, what's around us as well. And also it'd be interesting to consider the cooling effect the parklands has on the surrounding suburban areas. And we may need to pitch that to state government to say, hey, we sh you should give us more greening money because we've got the parklands, which we spend a heck of a lot of money taking care of. Um, uh, so I think we need to quantify that benefit as well and also quantify that to our neighbouring councils. Um, regarding water resilience, um, wetlands are lovely and all, but um, uh, really be interested to see how many and where they pop up. I think certainly, certainly the Riverbank precinct, people do like that, looking like a classical riverbank, I guess. Um, uh, and that also um, brings the Rhino Park Lake to mind as well. Could never turn that into a wetland. Um, put as many wetlands as you want around, you know, greening the Fullerton Road, but don't, don't touch that one. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that's all for me. Right. Cool. Right. Any contributions, questions? Yeah. No? Okay. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you all. <laughs>